This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by the GTEC Blockchain Contest. If you have an idea for a blockchain related project, make sure you apply for your chance to win awards worth 50,000 euros. Go to epicenterbitcoin.com slash GTEC, that's G-T-E-C, to learn more about GTEC and how you can apply. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Cuccio. And my name is Brian Fabian Green. Today we have a person on that probably most of you know in the, in the cryptocurrency and Bitcoin space is Brock Pierce. Brock Pierce has been involved in so many projects that if he listed all his titles and all his involvement, it would take up the first 10 minutes of the show. Uh, perhaps what he's best known at this point is that he's the chairman of the Bitcoin Foundation and he's also the managing partner of Blockchain Capital. Blockchain Capital has invested in lots and lots of companies in this space, like probably half of the companies that you know most people know. And uh, yeah, he's been involved in lots of projects here. So I'm, I'm super excited to have you on, Brock. Well, thank you guys for having me. I'm not sure it would take 10 minutes. Certainly not the titles worth, uh, I guess, worth stating. <laughs> 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 But, but that being said, so we have, you know, sort of gone through your background and I think that's one of the things that's really impressing, impressive and astonishing, just the, the wealth of different projects you have done. I'm curious, so how did you become, how did you become such an entrepreneurial guy and in, in starting, constantly starting new projects? Well, I think, uh, I, I mean, in some ways I was born an entrepreneur. Um, you know, I mean, even from the ages of probably what, five or six, I was building lemonade, you know, stand like businesses one after another. Um, uh, I mean, every little silly thing you would expect, uh, you know, uh, a kid to be doing. I think I was selling software, uh, by second grade. Uh, uh, and I found like this, um, uh, remember these games, word munchers, number munchers, Oregon trail and things of that nature. Anyway, the, uh, uh, one of the places I used to ha hang out frequently as a kid uh, uh, was one of the distributors there, and they would throw away any boxes that had any damages or anything else. And you know, I had kids jumping in the dumpster to pull all the software out, which then I would rent at school in like first or second grade for a dollar to rent it, which at the time mean you'd just install it. You'd pay five dollars if essentially you wanted the box and the manual and you know all the sort of supporting materials. Otherwise, you would just return it a couple days later. But uh, I built. Uh, lots of businesses like that in elementary school and then more as uh, as a teenager, which eventually led to starting my first real business when I was 17. And then that led to another and another and another. And, and somehow I ended up as a venture capitalist. Cool. Yeah, that, that is, I mean, first the lemonade stand is sort of, you know, the uh, stereotypical no, American entrepreneurship <laughs> story. So I mean, you got, everybody's got to start somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> Now, now, one thing that I thought was particularly interesting, perhaps we can dive a little bit deeper in there, is your involvement in, in gaming and digital goods, because I think that also sort of ties into then you know, how that led to your involvement in the Bitcoin space. Yeah, no, so I um, I'd raised uh, you know, like $88 million for my first company when I was 17. Business ended up spending 96. Um, obviously that didn't work out too well, uh, cause we didn't have much, well, we pre-signed $150 million worth of advertising contracts, but, um, we were never able to meet the fill rates required to actually collect. Um, that business was dependent upon broadband penetration rolling out, which, you know, clearly took about 10 years longer than every analyst had forecast. But at that point I found myself post the first internet sort of 1.0 bubble, uh, having collapsed it's, you know, mid 2000. And I said, okay, well, you know, at this point, the only skill I arguably have is, is as an internet entrepreneur at a time where there's no one in the world that wants to finance or, you know, even be pitched an internet idea. I said, okay, well, what else do I got? I can go get a, get a job or, or start something. And having grown up playing games, I had identified a, a market. Um, you, you had these early emerging, what you'd call massively multiplayer games or persistent worlds. And because these worlds were persistent in nature, the assets that you would accumulate in them had value. And so I identified that the people playing these online games had a desire to buy and sell the digital currency or the digital goods that they've accumulated. 
And this is really before any game company in the world uh, was buying and selling them. So I started testing that model in 98 and 99, kind of just in the background, but didn't have time to, uh, to do it seriously. Um, but you know, following the internet bubble burst, I went ahead and started a business called IGE, which uh, was initially focused on uh, uh, EverQuest and Ultima Online, and then games like Final Fantasy XI and you know Asheron's Call and others as they emerged. Eventually, World of Warcraft. Um, but it was you know quite an interesting thing. So if you were someone that had too much time on your hands, you may have more inventory than you needed, and if you were someone that might be working too hard, you might have more money than you need but you lacked some of the things that you wanted in that game world. So I was making a market between you know, players, essentially. Uh, I took that business uh, from 2001 to 2004, from zero to 100 million in revenue. The problem I had is I had more customers willing to buy uh, than I had players that wanted to sell. And so I had um, uh, you know, gone and taught the Chinese how they could play games professionally. Uh, to mine digital currency, which led to you know building up a supply chain of about four hundred thousand people in China that would play these games professionally to mine the digital currency that I would then sell into the Western markets, and I'm still doing uh, over a, over a billion dollars a year in that business today. So you started that thing because I mean I, I've certainly heard about you know basically you know factories quote unquote factories in China right where people basically play video games to get digital goods and then sell them. And that was your company that kind of started that uh, industry? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it was interesting because, again, I had more people that wanted to buy than I had people that wanted to sell. And so I was like, okay, how am I going to get more inventory? And I was looking through all of my sellers, and I, I noticed that there were. A, I was starting to see a few people emerging in Eastern Europe, a few people in Latin America, a few people in Asia, in it, you know, this is what it dawned on me that you know all someone had to have is a computer, an internet connection, the game software, and the ability to pay for it, and they could play from anywhere in the world. And if you were a good gamer, you could make a you know a few hundred, a couple hundred dollars a day, uh, which you know if you were in China in two thousand one, you know that's a lot of money depending upon where you are in China. And so I, I said, okay, I see, I definitely need to take this, you know, sort of you know great job opportunity to the developing world. Now, the question was where? Um, and I thought that the Chinese, in particular, had the greatest propensity to game. I mean, and as you've noticed, it's a huge gaming market, similar to like South Korea, more so than, you know, call it the rest of the world. And so China seemed like the obvious place. I knew nothing about China at the time. And so basically jumped on a plane, moved to Hong Kong, opened up a phone book, you know, got a lawyer, got an office, got an accountant, you know, hired a recruiter and just started hiring people because I decided that I needed to be near the epicenter of where I thought my industry would emerge. Then I set up shop in Shanghai and set up a team of hundreds of people that just started to educate everyone about how you can make more money than your dad, who's a doctor and a lawyer, you know, by playing games. Um, and that uh, is how I ended up creating the supply chain that I needed to, to sort of meet the demand in the developing world. That's really fascinating. And uh, so then how did you transition then into Bitcoin and now blockchain? Well, that came uh, you know, quite a bit later. So I, I ran that business until about 2007 as um, you know, founder and CEO, uh, then went on and started a, a number of other businesses, which you know, I don't think we're going to want to spend time on here today. But um, uh, having had a background in this, and I'm still in the business, uh, I, I just operate as chairman. I'm not the day-to-day -day sort of management team anymore. Um, and that business, is, as I said, still doing about a billion dollars a year in places like Korea. You know, we've got 99% market share in China. We're very active, the Western world. And so we're all over the place. But, um, uh, you know, anytime someone was working on a digital currency project, it was fairly common that I'd get a phone call. Uh, and so Bitcoin was on my radar from, you know, more or less the very beginning. I mean, the first call I got was, hey, Brock, uh, if you take a look at this, you know, sort of white paper thing, what do you think? I'm like, uh, hold on, I'm on the other line. Let me call you right back. The reality is I hadn't heard of it, and you know, <laughs> I didn't want to be like, no. Uh, so I did a quick Google search, you know, at least, you know, got a, a, a formed a 10-minute opinion, made the call back. I'm like, yeah, well, yeah, Bitcoin looks interesting. This or you know, something like it is clearly the future. I just don't know if the future is now or 25 years from now. And they're like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> and uh, uh, I went ahead and, you know, at that point played around little bit of mining, nothing 
actively. I wasn't convinced or sold that this is something I needed to focus on. Because if anything, what I learned from my experience as an early entrepreneur is that market timing was everything. Um, but uh, you know, at that point, started tracking Bitcoin and checking in on it. You know, every few months, I wasn't you know an active participant in the community until about 2012, uh, uh, and that's when it had become clear that momentum was you know building, critical mass you know was forming. You were starting to see entrepreneurs you know, um, you know building businesses. You were starting to see capital take an interest. Um, and that's when I said, okay, I should start thinking about moving all of my time and energy into, into this market, which I, I did shortly thereafter. Uh, at least it, it took me a little while to start talking very publicly about it. Uh, cause my, my first concern was regulatory in nature. I'm like, this looks really interesting, but I could see governments reacting very negatively. Um, I know orange is the new black, uh, in fashion, at least, uh, uh, but I didn't think I would look very good in that color. Um, striped jumpsuits, I don't think, work too well on me either. But uh, uh, you know, that was how that migration had happened. It had been, uh, and, and there's not just me. There's a lot of us that came out of call it the video game sort of uh, aspect of virtual currency. Uh, Jesse Powell, the uh, 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 the founder of Kraken, ran a website called Loot.com, and you know Hayden Gill, and I know I know dozens uh, of us in this space that ended up here through that path versus, you know, you know, one of the three or four other, you know, kind of most likely paths that would have brought Bitcoin, you know, uh, uh, into your scene in the call it 2011, 12 sort of. So then what, what, why is it, do you think that there are so many people coming from that, uh, from that sort of gaming ecosystem bringing, bringing and coming into to the Bitcoin space? What are the type of things that you learn in your previous businesses that, uh, are, uh, are of good value to you now that you're in the, in the Bitcoin space? Well, yeah, I mean, it was, it, it, it's pretty simple in the sense that 10 years ago, someone would say, Brock, you're selling hundreds of millions of dollars of digital currency that only exists in games like World of Warcraft. They're like, that doesn't make any sense to me. Why would anyone pay for that stuff? So, Because if you didn't play these games, you didn't understand it. The insight for me was the same insight that led to Bitcoin. And then obviously that insight has expanded. And that was that just because something is intangible doesn't make it any less valuable. Very simple insight. And almost all great businesses are built off something simple like that. But to, to the average person, you know, 10 years ago, that would have sounded kind of insane. Um, uh, and I think that's what allowed the people that came uh, into the industry with my background is we already had established that, you know, something being digital in nature didn't reduce its value in any way. If anything, it might have increased its utility. So that was what caused us to at least... Um, I think say, okay, Bitcoin is very fascinating from this perspective. Um, and you're starting to see that, you know, there's value being ascribed to it. Markets are emerging, transaction volumes are increasing. Uh, and then you start looking at obviously the, uh, uh, all of the other applications of the technology. You start to then as an, a, a matter of curiosity, start studying the history of money, start understanding, you know, issues with the current financial system, which causes, you know, the peeling back of the onion in this industry that we all go through. And I, I imagine we're still all peeling back the onion. Uh, you know, we might be pretty deep into it, but uh, 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 I think everyone found, there, for all of us, there was something, some hook that caused us to become interesting, you know, interested in, the, in, in what's going on here and then start to, to figure out kind of the many layers that exist in Bitcoin. You know, I, I don't know what level we're all on, but it feels like if it were a video game or, you know, maybe level 37 or something of that nature. <laughs> and, 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 and it might be one of those games that, you know, you know, it never ends. <laughs> right. So I'm curious, when you were running the, the game, the, the company with all these people playing video games in China, how did you do payments back then? Was that also part of the thing that you sort of saw in Bitcoin? It's like, well, this would be an easy way to, to handle pay payments for this. Well, that was, a, a, again, a big part of what I learned. Anyone that sold built any substantial e-commerce business online has learned that payments, you know, are one of the biggest problems of being on the internet, certainly 10, 15 years ago. Uh, it's gotten a lot easier because of businesses like Square and Stripe if you're trying to just be a domestic business. But um, yeah, my company was, uh, I think we were the PayPal's largest merchant for about three years in a row. Uh, there was a, a project code named Project IGE, which was, uh, uh, I helped design and actually 
caused PayPal to create their um, external credit card processing piece. If you wanted to, um, if you use PayPal as a merchant, um, call it 10 years ago, uh, and you sent a customer off to, to pay for something, uh, PayPal would require that user to sign up for PayPal to be able to pay you with a credit card. I said, that's you know unacceptable that you're creating friction in my transactions. And uh, they said, well, we're not going to do it any other way. So I shifted, you know, uh, 50 or $100 million of transactions to a competing platform that would allow me to do that. And they said, okay, wait, 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 we'll build it. And, and so that's how the, the external credit card processing business got built. So that was on the, the sort of Western side. And after eBay, we were the largest driver of new customers. I mean, keep in mind when, when PayPal was early on in the you know, 2002, 2003, 2004 period, there were no Walmarts using it. There were no big merchants. It was companies like mine that were the largest in the world that were getting PayPal all of their early customers. Um, that also then led to uh, becoming essentially the main business driving all the initial customers to Alipay or if you're familiar with Alibaba. Uh, so Alipay had approached us and said, you know, we would like to, uh, we understand the value that you've driven to PayPal. Uh, you know, can you, you know, start using us to process all your transactions in China? I said, well, I'm not sure I really want to do that. Uh, because I'm going to start to enable all of my Chinese supply chain to be able to, you know, accept payments from, you know, my customers abroad. Uh, eventually, I'm going to be, you know, fueling the competition for my own business. And they're like, no, 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 no. Well, what do you need to be able to drive us all of our initial business? And this is when Alipay was nothing of a company. Uh, I said, well, I want an exclusive on all digital assets. And so we we did enter into an exclusivity contract, which, um, uh, you know, like a lot of things in China. Uh, wasn't worth the paper it was printed on, but um, you know I was uh, uh, de definitely an early pioneer in the world of, uh, of of payments, and as a result of that, recognized the friction, the value of something like uh, uh, Bitcoin. I mean, and one of the arguments I've been making for many years now is that only about twenty five percent of the world's population has the ability to participate in the internet economy. Bitcoin is democratizing, you know, uh, the global financial system, but in the area of internet payments in a way where everyone is going to be able to participate in the internet economy. And that's a big deal. And that was one of the sort of many, uh, I think, um, reasons why I, I, I saw this, you know, to be such an, an interesting opportunity. Cool. Fantastic. And, and then you got involved in Bitcoin sort of properly in 2012. What did that look like? And what kind of projects did you pursue back then? Well, uh, uh, again, it was mostly just dedicating a lot of time to what do I want to do. Um, uh, acquiring Bitcoin uh, and Bitcoin mining was the you know sort of the area where we started, which led to eventually having about ten percent of all of the batch one Avalons. Uh, so I've got some a, a good little mining operation, but that was the and, and the reason I got into mining. Uh, uh, well, at first there's the allure of buying a machine that prints money. Um, you eventually start to build better calculators and predict you know you know difficulty. Uh, uh, sort of rate increases, and then mining starts to lo lo lose some of its allure. And you know, most of the hardware was prototype, so learning to manage it and just keeping the hardware online, you know, starts to become a full time job. And you know, building scripts to set off alarms when things aren't working, and you, know, you end up not sleeping for well for months at a time. But um, uh, it was a lot of what I would call, or I think as, as Eric Voorhees had called when we first started shagging, he's like, "Oh, you've been like one of these Bitcoin ninjas." I go, yeah, I was just kind of nervous about, you know, publicly, you know, kind of getting out there. I think uh, I started uh, uh, talking very broadly, not just within my sort of uh, smaller social circles. Uh, I became very open about everything I was doing by the uh, the San Jose Bitcoin conference. And that's when uh, I'd said, all right, I looked at, you know, kind of a few dozen opportunities. Uh, historically, as an entrepreneur, I normally would start one company and start building that. But I saw dozens of interesting opportunities. I couldn't figure out which was best. Uh, and so I made a decision to start just incubating companies. You know, I'd build one after another after another. And that led to, you know, uh, a number of, you know, there was a, a Bitcoin sort of long fund in there, similar to the Bitcoin Investment Trust. I decided not to go forward with it because I didn't think the fees were very interesting and scaling it, you know, looked at building a public ETF, got pretty far along the path of doing that in Canada. I actually had full approval to do that back in 2013. Uh, and it's funny, we, we didn't start seeing that until more recently. But my, my view was it's easier to do that internationally than it was domestically. And I think that's proven probably true in retrospect. Um, started companies like GoCoin uh, and you know a handful of others. But what I figured out very quickly there is 
Uh, I also couldn't scale. Uh, there's only so many businesses. I think I'm, I'm the founder of about 12 companies that are operating today. Uh, and that takes up a lot of time. Uh, uh, and the ability to add any new businesses is essentially impossible for me. Uh, and so if I wanted to continue to get broader exposure to the sector, the only way to do that was as an investor, which is how blockchain capital got started. Um, you know, decided if, you know, I want to, uh, broadly, um, participate in the overall ecosystem, I have to buy my way into everything, um, which is you know, essentially what I've done the last now few years. Let's take a short break to talk about the GTEC blockchain contest. GTEC, the German tech entrepreneurship center, is a new center in Berlin for entrepreneurship and they want to support exciting projects happening in this space. So that's why they're running a blockchain contest together with RWE, which is one of the largest energy companies in Europe and Globumbus, a foundation supporting entrepreneurship. You can participate by submitting your idea for your project and win up to $50,000 in free grant money. That's equity for you. Just take the money and do what you want with it. Uh, anybody can apply, whether you're a, a, an early stage startup and perhaps you just have an idea, a blossoming idea, and uh, or you can apply if you've already raised funding and are well on your way to becoming the next uh, multi-billion dollar company. And anybody can apply, whether you're in Berlin and Siberia, in Shanghai, or in San Francisco, uh, there's no geographical restrictions, and anybody who applies can win up to 12 months of free office space in Berlin, uh, free mentoring, legal support, etc. Of course, that's totally optional. If you want to stay in Siberia and work on your blockchain startup, you can also do that. The application deadline is March 31st, so make sure you submit your idea as soon as possible. You can learn more about the contest and apply by going to epicenterbitcoin.com slash gtech, that's G-T-E-C. And we hope you'll win, we hope you'll make it to Berlin to collect your money and that we'll get to hang out in person. Now we would like to thank uh, GTech, RWE and Globumbus for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So... Let's talk about uh, the Bitcoin Foundation, uh, of which you are the chairman. Um, so it's, it, it seems that the Bitcoin Foundation has uh, lost, in my, in my opinion, I think Brian would probably agree that it has lost a lot of its, uh, um, its visibility in the space. I mean, maybe because you know, there's been so much debate, like this block size debate has been taking up so much of the, of the, uh, of the interest of everyone, but for other reasons as well, um, I'd, like, I'd like you to tell us what is the current state of the Bitcoin Foundation? What um, how has this role evolved since perhaps two, three years ago when it was a lot more present, in, uh, it seems, in the community? Well, I mean, the Bitcoin Foundation early on, you know, was performing a, 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 an important function that no one else was performing at the time. You know, it was the first organization that was set up to, you know, advocate and educate on behalf of the industry. It was set up to help finance core development at a time where, you know, that hadn't been occurring. So, you know, and then building, you know, conferences that brought many of us together and great conferences. I mean, you know, uh, uh, San Jose was phenomenal. Amsterdam, I don't know if, you know, we were both there. Yeah, was quite, great. quite, I imagine quite, a, quite a, a large number of the audience was there and these were, were, were great events, you know, but like all things, you know, the industry evolved and the organization needed to evolve along with it. So uh, the foundation made it a couple of, you know, substantial missteps. Uh, one is, uh, you know, like all of us, and understandably so, when Bitcoin was on that big run in 2013, you know, that balance sheet of Bitcoin starts looking like a lot of money. And, you know, most of us were like, okay, it's going to go from 500 to 5,000 to, you know, I mean, we were all kind of, you know, we were all drinking the Kool-Aid and probably, you know, a little bit uh, uh, getting a little too excited. And that was true of every company. I mean, look at all the companies in the space. They started ramping up you know, staffing levels and engineering and advertising to things like the Bitcoin bowl. I mean, there was this, you know, kind of like the internet bubble of 1999 or any of these things. Everyone got a little excited, probably start, started spending more than they should, you know, just because everyone was, you know, hoping to, you know, we were, we were on the, the, the roller coaster ride at the moment and everyone was quite excited. Now, the mistake the foundation made is it didn't, uh, you know, it, it didn't, it failed to recognize that organizations like this are never going to receive massive amounts of money. Uh, they, they normally wouldn't. And that like a pension plan or an endowment of a university, you know, that capital needed to be better, uh, better um, saved because you're not going to get more of it. The reason we had a big balance sheet is because we had received lots of Bitcoin early on and we had benefited from the appreciation. So we, we, we spent too much money. We scaled that back. Um, we consciously made a decision to uh, 
uh, to move core development out of the organization. So, you know, very happy that, you know, Gavin and, uh, 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 and team ended up over at MIT, which I think is a much better place. You know, I mean, th that, that happened as a result of uh, uh, Patrick and Gavin having run around the industry and said, okay, you know, if we're really going to be financing development here, we need millions of dollars. And, you know, the thing that we had heard from, you know, the companies that had the funds or the VCs that had the capital to be able to do this was we would rather see this inside of an academic institution than inside of the Bitcoin Foundation, you know, with its elected board and, you know, its, its issues and things of that nature. And we said, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, uh, and so that I think was a great outcome, you know, for the industry and clearly more core development is needed. Uh, uh, I'm glad anytime anyone's supporting that. And the foundation has had to ask itself, okay, is there a role for us in the industry? Because now there's not just the Bitcoin Foundation. You've got other groups like, you know, Coin Center and things that are focused on policy. Uh, we decided as an organization, and we're still the largest membership organization in the industry by far. We're still the most recognizable organization in the industry by far. And it's called as the, you know, the stewards that are governing, you know, governing this entity, what should we be doing? Okay, we shouldn't be, you know, financing core development because we don't have the money to do so. And there are other organizations that are better situated to do so. We don't believe that we can represent our constituents in being in, deeply involved in policy because, you know, that's a, there's a, always going to be a large group of people with different opinions. You know, we shouldn't be saying that here's our political position other than what we've decided, which is, you know, we believe in, you know, we don't want to encourage regulation. We think that uh, this is a, you know, an industry that's young and uh, uh, it needs time to, uh, to flourish and grow before those conversations start. You know, we're very much aligned with the, uh, the EFF, uh, um, which uh, I think is the right position to take from a policy perspective and, you know, get too deeply into lobbying of governments. So then what's left? It's advocacy, it's education. Uh, you know, I think we've got a pretty, pretty good board with the, the, uh, the new recent board members. I don't know if you followed that, but, um, and we've got a strategy that we hope to announce uh, uh, by the beginning of Q2, which is April 1st. And that is that I think we've determined a path to be able to, uh, you know, the grow, grow the, the Bitcoin Foundation's membership to, uh, you know, to a million users uh, uh, and to be a hub for sort of connecting the world's Bitcoin enthusiasts, which I think is a good role for us. And, you know, we as a board, if we can't figure out how to make the organization, you know, if we can't figure out how to have an, a material and positive impact on the industry, you know, then, you know, then we'll become, you know, irrelevant. Um, you know, we've been through, you know, a difficult period. Uh, like a lot of Bitcoin companies today. I mean, we're, we've been in the bear market. It's not just the foundation. Uh, uh, philanthropic organizations are going to suffer more than for-profit ones. But, uh, you know, I mean, if you go talk to, to Bitcoin companies today, it's, it's been tough. You know, we've had a, a very rough, you know, 2014 and 15. We've had, you know, the last six months have been a bit positive, but whatever positive sort of growth we've seen around the Bitcoin price, which is the primary sort of barometer of sentiment, Whatever you know, benefits we've seen there, we've we've lost you know in this sort of uh, uh, Bitcoin block size debate, which has created a great deal of uncertainty. Um, you know, forget about. So you, you have to think about our industry as you know what the perspective of us that are in it, you know, looking out, and then the outside world looking in. Uh, you know, financial markets really hate; they dislike uncertainty. And, you know, we as an industry are, you know, uh, starting to suffer, I think, a great deal from the external perspective. You know, the people that were thinking about getting involved, the people that like the technology, the people that, you know, you know, had ambitions or plans to play here. A lot of those people are, are being turned off by what I like to think of as, you know, self-inflicted wounds. It's interesting. That you, you mentioned one thing that I thought was, was interesting is that you, you said that the foundation would focus more on... On enthusiasts, but you you didn't mention um, companies in there and industry players, and uh, so I, I I I as a trade organization, I imagine that that is obviously one of the mandates is to you know also cater to the industry, but in I, I, one one of the things that's obvious is that you know startups that were around in in 2013, 2014 and before that were mostly focused on. On consumer products with wallets and services and remittances and that kind of thing and since about a year we've seen a shift and now things are moving more into b2b and, and industry with uh, as regards to the use of the bitcoin blockchain that is uh not so much on the consumer side um how does the the bitcoin foundation plan to or 
how is the Bitcoin Foundation uh, evolving to to serve this this ob this new use of the Bitcoin blockchain in in industry? Yeah, I mean the early Bitcoin companies were focused on you know what I like to refer to as just basic infrastructure, you know, building of the the bridges, the roads, the tunnels, you know, kind of what people refer to as Bitcoin one point oh, um, and the reason you see less new companies in that area is because as investors, you know, you don't normally want to invest in the 10th, you know, Bitcoin exchange. You know, certainly exchanges benefit from network effects. Um, and so that's where, you know, capital has migrated to this concept of, you know, Bitcoin 2.0, that, you know, sort of blockchain, uh, 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 you know, application layer. Uh, and we've seen a lot of that. Um, and that's continuing to evolve. Um, but as the foundation, yeah, we've got, uh, I mean, obviously I got elected as a, a representative of the industry membership, um, which is not surprising, you know, when you've invested in 40 plus companies that, you know, the companies are, I mean, everybody, they, they all knew me pretty well. Maybe the, the, the individual membership didn't, but, uh, you know, it was, it was probably, it's not unlikely when you've invested in everyone that you're also going to get their votes. <laughs> um, but, uh, 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 you know, and that's also because everybody, you know, knows you, obviously. Um but uh, 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 you know the, the the industry membership is, I mean, obviously the the perspective that I operate from. But I'm not sure if we're going to be as able to play as big a role there as I think we can in the individual membership. I mean, the thing that the Bitcoin Foundation has uh, is the largest individual individual sort of membership base. We have thousands of people, and if we eliminate eliminated the need to pay, you know, to become a a member of the Bitcoin Foundation. If we eliminated the affiliate program that existed, where you had to sign a you know a thirty-page contract and give up half of the revenues that your affiliate chapter generated, and if we made that free, uh, and picked you know kind of the best people in countries all around the world to head up the foundation's activities, if we said you know if you want to become a member of the foundation, it's it's free to sign up and then have various paying tiers, you can see there's probably an easy path to organizing the world's Bitcoin user base, and so that you have that you know million-person email list. And the industry members, I think, benefit more than anything by having a channel to be able to communicate with everyone because not everybody hangs out in Reddit. Not everyone hangs out in Bitcoin talk. There are a lot of people that are you know, enthusiasts, huge believers, spend a lot of their time, but they don't hang out in those sorts of forums or channels. And figuring out a, a, a way to communicate with, call it the broader Bitcoin community all over the world, uh, I think is you know, a potentially achievable task for an organization like ours. Um, you know, and again, there's, you know, when you have an organization that's small, where most of your staff is volunteer, and you don't have a whole lot of money, you know, you have to pick your battles. You can't try and boil the ocean and do 10 things at once. It's called, where can we add value? Where can we be most helpful? Again, on the lobbying front, you've got great organizations attempting to do that. In terms of the financing core development, you know, we've got academia, you know, supporting that. So where, you know, our job is not to compete with other organizations. Our job is to figure out how can we continue to add value in the same way that you know we did uh, as a foundation early on, and hopefully we can continue to do that going forward. Today's magic word is Sinbad, S-I-N-B-A-D. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener award. So Brock, you mentioned before uh, the block size uh, debate and, and how that has harmed the industry in the past six months. What's your personal view on, on what's going on there? Well, I mean, I, I think that this harm is inevitable. Um, and, and, and that's part of the problem with an open source development project where the debate is public. You know, everyone gets to see how the sausage is made and it's not pretty. Um, and this is different than any other open source project because you've got billions of dollars of value involved. And so people are going to uh, you know, take these decisions much more seriously than they would in, call it, other sector, sectors. So it's not surprising to me that you know, the things are going the way that they're going and creating this sort of uh, uh, uncertainty from a public perspective. But I believe it's going to be a, a, a successful experiment when we eventually reach consensus you know, we're going to look back on it, and I think we're going to say, you know, Bitcoin's corporate, you know, Bitcoin's governance, you know, is a success. You know, this idea of consensus building around distributed systems. But you know, as we go through this, you know, it 
creates a, a lot of uncertainty. Once it's been solved, everyone's going to say, ah, I see how that works, you know, assuming it's solved. Um, you know, from a, a block size perspective, you know, or can we scale? Because when, well, I guess the best thing I like to frame this as when people bring this up with me, they're like, oh, yeah, isn't Bitcoin having scalability issues? Oh, didn't my current just say Bitcoin's a failed experiment? Blah, 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 blah. I would say, well, let's start and take a look at the first aspect of this. Bitcoin is so successful, it's, it's scaling exponentially. And as a result of that, or growing exponentially, we're running into scalability issues. These are the problems that Facebook has. Is, you know, has. This is the problems that WhatsApp has. This is the problem of very, very successful technologies. So let's start and make sure that we understand that we're not talking about Bitcoin as a failure. We're saying Bitcoin is a success. And as a result of that, we need to scale it. So you know, I think that's an important way for any of us when talking to external parties, you know, that we're framing the issue correctly. Bitcoin is becoming a victim of its own success. Um, so uh, that's issue number one. Now the question is, is it scalable? Uh, my belief is absolutely. It's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of how. And so what's going on now is you've got a lot of very, very smart people, core developers that care a great deal about Bitcoin, uh, that are putting forth their proposals as to how to best scale this. Um, and, you know, uh, we have a number of different opinions, which is not surprising. And, you know, we'll, we'll come to uh, a resolution at some point, hopefully sooner, in my opinion, than later. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm not the, I don't think I'm the person that's best qualified to say this is the right approach. Uh, I just hope we find an approach. Uh, you know, my guess is that we're going to end up with a, a two megabyte block size increase sooner rather than later. Uh, uh, probably before the halving, because that seems to be what everybody wants, uh, even though that might be sooner than some people think we should do it. Uh, you know, that probably goes to four, and we probably end, end with, you know, segregated witness at some point. Um, but again, I'm, I'm going to defer to, you know, the core developers, and I spent a lot of time talking with many of them, trying to understand why they have differing views, and, you know, hopefully, you know, and then trying to help bring people together so that people can you know, understand concerns, you know, that another might have so that we reach consensus again sooner rather than later. Right. I, I mean, talking about the governance process, right? So you, you can, I, I think that's one of the, the big problems here, right? It's because you, you sort of have two discussions going on at the same time. One is the, the discussion about, you know, what is the right thing for the system? What's the right thing for the network? Like, you know, can it handle this block size? You know, should we do this before the other thing? You know, is segregated witness a good scalability solution? All of those questions. And then at the same time, you have all those discussions about what's the right process to even discuss this and reach a decision and who should have what to say here. And I think that makes it really hard to make any progress because you have this these questions on two different levels at the same time. And, and it's sort of also... A way, of course, if you disagree with one party about yeah, you know, the content of the question, you can sort of just move the discussion to the process side or the other way. And I think this way, this has made it hugely difficult to, to make real progress there. I mean, hopefully it will be resolved. But personally, I think there's a, there's a real problem there and that there is not really more of an explicit way to say, Here's how we're going to discuss those questions, and here's how we're going to reach decisions. Yeah, I mean, as an industry, we could have been a little bit more organized in how we ran through this process, but you know, I, I feel that's coming together. Um, you know, we may end up with two competing sort of development teams or more. Um, I'm not sure that's a bad thing. Competition is, is, is probably good, uh, though I think we need you know, consensus and resolution sooner rather than later. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I, yeah, uh, uh, I think that historically the core developer community had, you know, not done a great job of, you know, communicating with the rest of the industry, but, you know, I think that's improving rapidly, you know, the mining industry, you know, staying deeply, you know, being in constant communication with core developers is something that wasn't happening historically, but I believe that's happening now. Um, I mean, we're growing up, we're maturing, and we're having to put together these better processes, hopefully so that we get to the best answer in the short term, but also so that we, you know, these, uh, we have less of these issues going forward. You know, we're putting in place, you know, you know, a, a process for how to continue to update uh, the underlying code, and I believe that we'll get there, um, and I believe everyone's learning how to work together. 
even though again it's it's been a, a painful process thus far and it doesn't look like we're you know near the finish line just yet so, so assuming you can reach an agreement, right? Assuming that it's not like core developers or the developers get on the same page and say, okay, this is the way forward. What do you think is the right way to resolve this? Is it is the right way that, you know, you have different clients and kind of the miners decide by putting their hash rate behind, you know, the client that they support? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, that's one path forward that may happen. I'm not sure that's going to be the best path, but it's a path and it's a path that's possible at this point. And, uh, you know, you could end up with hard forks and two Bitcoin networks. Uh, and then, you know, when we think about the sort of the governance and the democracy of the system, then the third portion of the ecosystem. So you got the developers that are, you know, putting forward code and proposals. You got the miners that are deciding what runs and gets processed, but then you've got the payment processors and the exchanges, you know, the, the 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 coin that wins in a fork is also going to be the one that's the most useful. So you know, if BitPay and GoCoin and Coinbase and others say, you know, this is the coin that all the merchants are accepting, that starts to matter. And so what you start to learn is that everyone in the ecosystem is important and has a role in this. It's not just the core developers. It's not just the miners. There's no one party that you know really has the control over Bitcoin like we used to debate. We used to think, oh, it's the miners. You know, the miners have too much, or you know the it's the core devs. Everybody has a role to play in the industry in terms of reaching consensus. Uh, uh, and depending upon where we are in the process, you know, some people may have more influence than others. Obviously, core developers have the most influence over the code getting written, but you don't need all the core developers together. In theory, I guess one core developer could end up writing the code that ends up being implemented, right? Um, you know, and the mining piece has got its, uh, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll see how this all plays out. Um, and you know, it could end up, we could end up seeing a hard fork. I think that that's going to have a negative impact on price in the short term, but in the long run, it might be, it might be healthy. Again, I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, and one thing I've always learned in life is you never know if something is good or bad until you have the benefit of hindsight. And I mean, a lot of hindsight, uh, uh it normally takes many years. I mean, I, I know lots of stories and I'll, I'll keep it short, but you know, I've met people that have come to me and said, ah, oh, this is the worst day of my life. Oh my God, this was so awful. What happened to me? Oh, I out of this job. I, you know, I was a founder. I can't believe my partner screwed me. Whatever may have happened, you know, they end up selling their stock, you know, and three years later, they're the only ones that made any money on the company. So what was the worst day of their life ended up being the best day of their life. And again, until you have the benefit of hindsight, it's difficult to know whether something is good or bad. Um, you know, um, but again, uh, 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 financial markets really dislike uncertainty. And I think Bitcoin is suffering, you know, we're uh, suffering from self-inflicted wounds as it relates to the external world, you know, looking in. Now, I tend to agree with Brian and that, that, that this whole process has been really messy. And uh, it's it's strange because we've seen this before and we you were there in the 90s at the, the dawn of the internet. And I think you probably remember what it was like working with, uh, uh, you know, building websites back then, that kind of thing, and, and and how every industry player had their own standards, and and you know we came to to build standards because of organizations standardizing bodies like W three C or or the IEFT, uh, and I think that at some point, if Bitcoin wants to be taken seriously by industry key industry players like corporate, uh, large corporate companies, enterprise, as well as um, uh, as just governments and, 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 uh, and states, um, Bitcoin will need to be to become standardized in some way, uh, whether that means joining the, uh, the IEFT or simply creating another standards body for Bitcoin and potentially even blockchain technologies as, as a whole uh, that would borrow some of the concepts and some of the, 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 the standard uh, process that they've developed and has tried and tested to, to come to consensus around these kind of things. Um, the, Brian mentioned earlier that we, or perhaps it was before the show, that we had Manu Sporny on a couple of weeks ago, who is at W3C and is working on on, on the payment standard uh, proposal there. And his, you know, he's, he's very close to the Bitcoin community. And, and, and he, he, what he mentioned is that every time that he's tried to bring up the idea to people in the Bitcoin community that, you know, you know these are the standards, the standard process that we have at, w, at the W3C, you know, the Bitcoin community should look at these as a potential way to come to consensus that, that he's uh, all, most often been met with, with resistance. Uh, and I find that kind of alarming and I find it kind of 
too bad that uh, that the Bitcoin community, uh, rather than um, try to do things in a disorganized way, wouldn't just look at these uh, other processes that we already have in place to to come to consensus. What do you think about that? I I believe in you know you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you do anything. I mean the idea of using a a roadmap that has worked successfully in the past I think is a great idea. Um, again, I think the the issue here is the fact that there's billions of dollars you know at play, uh, and that just adds another you know another element to it that makes it probably you know more complicated to reach consensus by an order of magnitude. And yeah, everyone's seeing how the sausage is made. And, and the really unfortunate thing is the timing of it all. You know, it's taken all of us working in this industry until really 2015, 2016, for the broader world to finally take what we're doing seriously, at least in recognizing that there's merit in the technology if nothing else, right? And now as these large organizations and governments and things are taking a look at what we're doing very seriously, you know, Bitcoin is basically, I think, getting uh, dismissed in a big way when, you know, it has potential to kind of really reach the world stage that we had all been hoping for. Uh, and so the timing, I don't think, could be any worse. You know, it, it's literally as organizations like IBM and, you know, major banks and governments around the world are looking at this, they're going, okay, yeah, we, we like this, you know, Bitcoin bad, but, you know, they could get potentially over that blockchain good. Oh, but we don't want to have anything to do with Bitcoin's blockchain because that's got all this uncertainty and, you know, you know all these sort of infighting and things that make it, you know, an unreliable platform. Uh, uh, which is really unfortunate because things are moving elsewhere, um, again, due to self-inflicted wounds. And the timing, I don't think, could be any worse. You know, in 2014, it wouldn't have mattered very much. And it may not, would, may not have mattered as much next year. But the decisions are being made in boardrooms around the world right now as to where and how to build on this technology. And you know, Bitcoin, sadly, is you know, missing out on a ton of interesting opportunity. Um, you know, again... It's why I, I hope we find consensus sooner than, sooner than rather, rather than later. And you know, some of the damage this is doing is going to be permanent. You know, not permanent, but at least it's going to set back the industry by years. And it's allowing competitive solutions to you know achieve scale that might not have otherwise. Yeah, I, I think that's a, I think that's exactly right. The timing here really did not work out well. I mean, I think there's of course there's been some other challenges that probably were. Uh, in the way of having a larger scale adoption. Uh, in particular, I think the consumer adoption has sort of been underwhelming. Um, so the consumer adoption has been, you know, a bit below expectations, especially, you know, if you think back to 2013, 2014, you know, cause you sort of saw that, that scale, okay, everybody adopts it, we can use it as a payment system and, and this will have a huge, tremendous positive impact. And that has sort of, stayed behind and i think that has also contributed to you know people being much more hesitant to build on bitcoin i mean i, I personally certainly uh, felt that was a, a big factor in evaluating opportunities in this space was that you know if if the success of your company is like fully dependent on bitcoin adoption it's it just add, it layers risks up right you have to, all the regular startup risks and then you have this risk of this thing, you know, does it get adopted and what time horizon, you don't know. Um, but then, yeah, of course, the block size debate here has, has definitely been a big, a big negative because otherwise we, maybe we would have seen a much more adoption, especially on the payment uh, system side. And, you know, maybe one would have seen integration into things like PayPal wallets. And, and Yeah, so, the, I mean, the consumer adoption piece is uh, something I now understand, I, I, I think, we all had kind of been hopeful in the same way that, oh, we had our eureka moments and we're all like, ah, Bitcoin, Bitcoin's the future, you know, Bitcoin is our savior, all of these sorts of, you know, when, when, when you have that, that, that epiphany. Um, but, uh, uh, I mean, when you first heard about Bitcoin, how long did it take for you to acquire your first Bitcoin? You know, what was the time between your, when you first became aware of it and when you actually got access to your first Bitcoin? Oh, it was like three weeks or something like that. It was pretty, uh, I, I, I learned about it. I became immediately obsessed. It was uh, summer of 2013. I started listening to all the old Let's Talk Bitcoin episodes, sort of caught up on everything. And I, I was pretty, uh, pretty quick to be, you know, fairly uh, all in. And that was incidentally, it was also sort of 
the price just started rising. I mean, at the time it wasn't very high. It was like seven ninety dollars or something like that. But it was just when it started picking up, and it, I think that also contributed a little bit to the sort of wrong impression I had at the time, which was that you know I've discovered this. It makes so much sense. The price is rising. The whole world is waking up to this. Uh, obviously, this is going to just take off. I think it might have been different if I had discovered it in a time, you know, in when it wasn't doing so well. But uh, since I was just taking off, I think that sort of contributed also to a, a little bit of um, a wrong impression. Yeah, that, it did that for all, anyone during that time period. It was a very exciting <laughs> Period and yeah. and we, we we just saw this path that we're going to go from a million users to ten million to a hundred million to a billion and this is going to take over the world and we all saw that path forward because we were looking at it from our sort of vantage point. So the your three week time is very fast. So for those of us that listen to this show, we are you know uh, uh, forward thinking, early adopters, technology sort of centric lives, uh, uh, you know people that think for ourselves. Uh, uh, and for people like us, it took takes days, weeks, months, or years from when we first learn about this technology to before we start using it. So how long do you think it's going to take the average person? Eventually, I do believe we'll reach a tipping point, but the consumer adoption, I'm, I'm not convinced, but I think it's highly likely that it's going to take a long time. And, and when we start to see consumer adoption, I think it's going to come in one of two places. It's going to come in the developing world where it's most needed, you know, Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia, you know, much in the same way that, you know, M-Pesa became very popular in Kenya because the people didn't have an alternative. You know, uh, for most of us that live in the developed world, you know, we've got a bank account, we've got plastic in our pocket that lets us, you know, conveniently pay for things. We've got rule of law that's there in theory, you know, to protect us. And we've got a currency that most everyone around the world wants more of. Uh, but in places where you, you know, you've got a huge percentage of the population on bank, they don't have, you know, payment infrastructure. That's where I could see something happening fast. Uh, but even then, or places with great economic uncertainty, the Venezuela, Argentinas, et cetera, where, you know, uh, uh, Bitcoin is less volatile and, 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 and is clearly, I think, a better store of value. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, that's where that could happen. But I think most of our growth is going to happen in, in ways where the consumer doesn't know. If you look at businesses like Abra, uh, uh, they won the launch uh, 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 festival last year as number one startup, and uh, you never heard the word Bitcoin once in their pitch. Uh, they're ro rolling out what I think is the most interesting Bitcoin remittance business, but again, you won't see the word Bitcoin anywhere in their product, and that's because they put Bitcoin into the plumbing. It's in the, the, the way that they move money across borders. So what is Bitcoin good at today? You know, there's a lot of theoret theoretical use cases where we say Bitcoin could do this, Bitcoin can do that, but does it do it better than the alternatives today? In most instances, no. You know, Bitcoin is a very interesting speculative investment, meaning that you know it's a scarce resource, and as more and more people want it, it's going to go up. Uh, uh, so that's an interesting, you know, use, which is the main use that most people started using it for. Everything else was theoretical, but today, though, it is better, faster, and cheaper, it may be the best way to move money between borders, you know, through a lot of, you know, country to country corridors. It does it faster and cheaper than a lot of the traditional financial system does today. And that's a real use case that's starting to work. The problem is convincing people that they need to use Bitcoin to do that. If you can actually, as a business, use Bitcoin to do that, but just tell customers I'm better, faster, cheaper than Western Union, uh, the minute you add the Bitcoin element, you're going to probably have a harder time convincing users to use your product than just using Bitcoin as a business and not telling them about it. Uh, and, and so I think a lot of our growth over the next couple of years is going to come from smart entrepreneurs and businesses figuring out how to use Bitcoin, but not putting it into their consumer product. Uh, I think consumer adoption is going to continue to grow much in the same way that we've joined, but it's going to be much slower going than we would like. You know, because it's a long process for people to say, okay, I understand why I want to use Bitcoin directly. Uh, so I think most of the growth, again, will come from businesses that intelligently figure out how to integrate it rather than convince consumers to use it, though I think both are going to continue to grow in parallel. So you think that both users that use Bitcoin directly and users that uh, are using Bitcoin without knowing about it are, will grow in parallel at sort of equal pace and at an equal uh, capacity? I, th I, think, I think the users that don't know about it are going to grow much more in terms of number of users the users that do know about it are, are normally going to be higher volume. 
So I think probably from a volume perspective, they'll grow at equal pace. But in terms of individual users, I think the people using Bitcoin directly is going to grow at a much slower pace, like we've seen. It's just it's a long process. It takes guys like us days, weeks, months, or years, you know, to start using Bitcoin. I think the average consumer, unless there's a strong need, you know, again, if you're in Kenya and you know you're paying the high rates that M-Pesa charges, there's a strong incentive to switch to Bitcoin and use BitPesa. If you're living in India. Uh, I was just in uh, uh, Bombay teaching at the Singularity University like uh, a week or two ago, excuse me, Mumbai. Um, uh, they have a huge population of people that are working in the Middle East today, uh, you know, and they're having, to, they're the biggest remittance country in the world. So I'm working in the Middle East. I'm sending money back home. Uh, I'm spending sol- sending small sums of money. The ability to save 5% is a really big incentive to use Bitcoin. And all it takes is one person that starts doing that in that community and then they tell their friend and their friend is like, I can save 5%. I can save 10% when I desperately need that money. My family desperately needs that money. You know, then I'm going to show my friend how to do it. And they're going to show five friends how to do it. And they're going to show five friends how to do it. Those are the areas where I can see you know, substantial consumer adoption. It's going to be not amongst people like us. It's going to be amongst people that need it the most and have the strongest incentive where it can improve their lives you know, materially, substantially. I mean, Bitcoin does not change, you know, most of our lives. I mean, it does, you know, from a philosophical perspective, uh, it does from, you know, but it's not really changing our lives other than if you had a lot of Bitcoin early on and and benefited from the appreciation. We believe in the long-term impact it's going to have, but it's not really radically transforming our lives today. But if you're, you know, working in India, sending money back home, and you're able to get 10% more home to your, you know, family and, you know, your kids, that is going to radically change your life for the better. And that's where I think you're going to see substantial adoption. So, but for for the foundation, though, as as you mentioned, as a, as a uh, as an organization that advocates to to end users on using this technology, if if the majority of people are using, and I think this is you know this is one of the use cases that's going to grow, where we have companies using Bitcoin uh, and the blockchain to power services where people don't actually know that they're using it. Uh, that's probably the best way to, to 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 deploy this type of technology to a mass market. Um, but what does that mean for the foundation? Like those people are not going to sign up for the foundation uh, to be members, uh, much like there's there's no sort of internet foundation where like every user of Facebook gets a membership to the internet foundation. Um, I, I'm just, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm unsure what the future of the foundation is if mass adoption is just of people that don't really understand the technology and not technologists, but just regular people. Yeah, I mean, I, again, I think this is not a one-year or two-year process. It's a 10-year process. I'm not advocating or saying that consumer adoption isn't going to happen. I just think it's a much longer road than we all had hoped. Uh, you know, you know, it's the sort of thing where, you know, we can go from a few million people using it to a few million more to 10 million more. And, you know, in five years, you know, hopefully we're at 50 or 100 million. And at some point, though, like Malcolm Gladwell would say, you reach an inflection point or a tipping point. And I think at some point we'll get there. I just don't think it's going to be in the next year or two, as much as I wished it were. You know, but you know, unfortunately, wishing and hoping isn't going to make it happen. Uh, 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 but there's still a role, you know, for us to continue to educate people about why Bitcoin matters. And it actually gets much easier to say, uh, "Oh, you're already using Bitcoin." They're like, "What do you mean I'm already using Bitcoin?" Well, you're you're sending money back home to the Philippines. How do you think you're doing that? And they go, well, I use that this service Abra, and you go, that is Bitcoin, uh, and and it's a lot easier, I think, to convince people to use something when you're able to show them that they're already using it. Um, but the consumer adoption is essential long term if we if, for Bitcoin to achieve many of the use cases that we all talk about. You know, if it's purely a a, a, a payment rail in the background, uh, you know, it still has a ton of potential. Um, but it's going to be a very different Bitcoin than the Bitcoin we think of, uh, you know. And I, you know, I'm I'm not, uh, you know, giving up on the long term consumer adoption side of this. I just think it's going to be a long road. Um, but you know, you know, sometimes great things uh, take time. So let's come back to the topic of uh, your fund and blockchain capital. Can you tell us a little bit of background about how it is structured and? The fund was started by me and my, my two other partners, which are Bart and Brad Stevens. Uh, I got to know them uh, more than a decade ago. They were an investor in my old virtual currency business. So they ran a 
uh, a half a billion dollar hedge fund, and they had uh, three or four venture capital funds that they were running. One of their uh, industries they were investing in was media and games. So they owned 9.99% of the nine, which was the publisher of World of Warcraft in China. They were an early investor in Tencent, which owns Riot that makes League of Legends. And you know, they had been very active game investors. And uh, the, the way that they would tell the story is they were playing World of Warcraft, doing their research and development. <laughs> Yeah, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, they started buying digital currency and digital goods. And you know, one day they had their like aha moment. They're like, "Hmm, we're spending a hundred or two hundred dollars a month with this company, and we only pay Blizzard fifteen dollars a month. There's a good business here. Let's start doing some research and figure out who owns it." And then they went and you know, looked up the top five or 10 sites. And then they started doing who is searches and doing background checks. And they saw my name behind all of them because I operated the top eight brands, um, which made it harder for anyone else to start up when I'm both the, the Walmart and the premium shops. And you know, I, I, was, I was running them all with different pricing strategies. And uh, 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 they eventually got a hold of me and they ended up participating. They invested a few million dollars in my old business along with Goldman Sachs and you know, a number of large institutions that financed me at the time. Um, and you know the Goldmans of the world found it interesting because I was essentially running a proprietary trading desk for you know thirty or, you know call it five hundred virtual countries. You know each game server you know looked like it had its own currency, which you know traded against you know uh, every other currency you know on its own at a different supply and demand type base. So we live in a world with call it two hundred countries and currencies. Uh, I was essentially running. The currency markets for another five hundred or a thousand, and so if you were a, you know, uh, ran, if you worked on a proprietary trading desk at, on Wall Street, you would kind of understand what I was doing very, very quickly. Um, so they invested in that business. I uh, uh, one of the things I wanted to do back in uh, 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 I don't know if it was late twenty twelve or early twenty thirteen, but I had gone to my board of directors of my old virtual currency exchange and said I want to buy this company called Mount Gox, and my board's like, what's that? I go, uh, uh, it's the largest Bitcoin exchange in the world. And Goldman Sachs was like, what? Bitcoin? Are you, you must be kidding me. And that was essentially the reaction of my whole board at the time, uh, including my partners today. Uh, uh, and I said, all right, well, you know, our industry, we've got all the market share. Our sector is only growing at 10% you know, a year. That you know, impacts, you know, if, if your industry is not growing rapidly, uh, the way that your business is valued is not that impressive. You know, your goal is to get a big multiple of revenue or a big multiple of earnings. And if your industry isn't growing, you're not going to see that. I said, we need to expand into a new market. I'm convinced that this, you know, this Bitcoin thing is going to be a big deal. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about Mt. Gox. It's uh, the biggest exchange in the world. They're, you know, they own this sector by far. The management team is maybe the most incompetent I've ever met. Uh, and their technology is awful. But I said, we've got management and we've got technology. <laughs> They've got market share. This is a perfect fit for us. And so uh, we went forward almost bought uh, Mt. Gox at the time. Uh, uh, they ended up, uh, uh, so I, I went back to the board, uh, uh, whatever, three months later, after I'd sent them a bunch of research material. So we went back on a call. I said, I'd like to buy Mt. Gox again. And they laughed uh, for a second time. I'm, and this is when I got a little upset. I'm like, I'm like, I mean, I've been building digital currency businesses for a long time. You guys have invested you know, nearly $100 million you know, in me in this particular field. Uh, and I said that this Bitcoin thing is very real and that you need to understand it so that we can have uh, uh, an informed conversation about this opportunity. And I sent you all the research material and none of you bothered to read it. I'm really, really disappointed in all of you. It's one thing to disagree with me. It's another not to have done your homework you know, and, and shown up and you know, been ready to debate you know, my view. So I called up my, my partners following that, uh, that board meeting mm -hmm. and I said, guys, you're, you're young. You invest in technology. You understand digital currency. Uh, uh, what's going on here? And you know, guilty as charged, they, you know, made a point of saying, "Brock, okay, you're right." And they spent uh, uh, a month researching uh, uh, the sector, talking to cryptographers, mathematicians, economists, venture capitalists, you know, anyone they could. And they took a very deep dive research project, which led to they shut down their hedge fund. And they were running a half a billion dollar hedge fund, and they shut it down to then come work full time with me. Um, so. I ended up being successful, not in buying Mt. Gox, but uh, uh, in terms of convincing you know, some of my investors that they need to, uh, to come get into the, this business. And then my other board members went on to fund Circle and you know, uh, a number of other businesses in the space because that's how they got their early education, uh, mostly with 
you know, me presenting what seemed like a joke of an idea to them at the time. But um, so blockchain capital is the first venture capital fund to uh, invest in, call it startups in the space on a, on a, a sector focused basis, meaning we don't invest in anything else. Uh, all we do is invest in this space. We've now got 44 um, portfolio companies and uh, uh, we're investing out of our, our second fund, which uh, had its final close uh, in the Q4 of last year. Um, and so we're, uh, you know, actively investing like the first uh, collection of companies were what we'd call those basic infrastructure type businesses, Bitcoin 1.0, a lot of Bitcoin companies. Uh, the second sort of phase of companies we've been investing in are sort of blockchain uh, SaaS or enterprise services businesses providing software to, you know, financial institutions and, and the likes. And, and the area that we're investing in most these days are uh, sort of non-financial use cases for blockchain technology. I don't know if you're familiar with companies like Stampery. Uh, they're focusing on legal services and, you know, notaries on the blockchain and creating immutable records. Um, uh, focused on, uh, we've invested in a company in, in Israel called Wave, which is very cool recently, uh, which is focusing on the global sort of shipping or global trade. That, that whole industry runs on a bill of lading and a letter of credit, and so they're doing some cool things there. Um, just invested in a company called Tyrion, which is uh, focused on some healthcare and insurance applications, again, asset registry. Uh, uh, we invested in a company called STEM out of Los Angeles, which is focused on content creation. Uh, and bringing transparency to an opaque market and getting money to content creators or artists, you know, quickly, uh, which, you know, so we're investing in a lot of these sort of edge use cases that are not yet obvious, you know, to, to everyone. Um, when we're, we're uh, you had mentioned before the show, but we're, we've also been very active uh, uh, in Ethereum. I mean, uh, uh, I was, uh, uh, I, I've been very active in sort of the Ethereum eco ecosystem, both as a large investor in the crowd sale and then uh, uh, having been friends with most of the, uh, the founders and watching its development up and into this point. So uh, I think you're going to see a number of interesting announcements related to the fund, you know, stepping up and being the first fund to actively finance a, a lot of companies building in and around that emerging ecosystem. You're starting a, a fund to just focus on Ethereum? No, 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 no. Um, uh, blo blockchain capital has always been, uh, well, we're stage agnostic, meaning we'll invest in seed stage all the way up to whatever stage. I mean, we, we were uh, uh, an investor in Coinbase's uh, Series C, for example. Um, most of the deals that we've done are seed stage or Series A because there's only been a couple of Series B type financings in the entire ecosystem. But we're stage agnostic. We'll invest at any stage. Uh, uh, and we're geographically agnostic. We'll invest anywhere in the world um, because it, we're... So, but the fund, the fund size, because I read somewhere that you guys raised a ten million dollar fund. Is is that just a part of it, or? Yeah, no. So we're the the, the second fund is uh, like a little over a thirteen, called a thirteen and a half million dollar fund. We also have an angel list syndicate. If you're familiar with angel list, yeah, uh, and we co co syndicate, you know, uh, a number of our deals, which you know, probably it takes the fund from being called a fifteen million dollar fund to about a twenty five million dollar fund. And then we have a number of sort of billionaire and high net worth LPs that have an interest in investing uh, in uh, uh, some of the deals. And what we'll do is we'll create what are called SPVs or special purpose vehicles to allow our LPs to invest more than our typical check size. You know, in some of these deals, we'll write checks that are, you know, three, four million dollars. We in theory could write checks as big as 10 or 20. So our fund is called the equivalent of a $50 million fund, though, you know, in terms of the committed capital, it's only about 15. Um, you know, and that is because you haven't had any institutional investors that have funded uh, uh, funds in our space, you know, up until the point that our fund had had its first close. I think that's going to be very different this year. But in the same way that we're geographically agnostic, um, stage agnostic, uh, we're also blockchain agnostic. Um, uh, but, you know, obviously the bulk of our investments have been around Bitcoin or Bitcoin's blockchain to date because... Bitcoin still is 80%, you know, of the market in terms of market cap and in terms of venture capital investment, it's 95% of, you know, or 90% of everything that's out there. And so Bitcoin still is obviously very representative of, you know, everyone's portfolio that plays in the space. I was actually uh, curious about that, whether, whether or not you would invest in other blockchain startups other than, 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 uh, than Bitcoin. Well, we're an investor in, in, in Ripple, for example. Um, okay. And that would be a perfect example of uh, uh, you know, something that wasn't, you know, Bitcoin clearly, and hasn't been for a very long time. But um, yeah, no, we'll, we'll, we're, we're 
we're blockchain agnostic as a firm, but again, the bulk of our investments are around uh, Bitcoin and Bitcoin's blockchain to date. Right. And do you guys have an explicit investment thesis or it's sort of is involved by a bigger view of the space and then your assessment of specific projects and teams? Yes. I mean, uh, our strategy as a firm is we typically don't uh, lead investments. Uh, we typically co-invest, uh, preferably with, you know, other generalist type venture firms. Um, and that's because we have so many investments. You know, we're, we're uh, about to hit our 45th investment. And so uh, as a firm with three partners, and I don't know if you know Jeremy Gardner, but uh, Jeremy's, you know, uh, 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 works with us full time and he's the, the fourth sort of most active person and then Will O'Brien. But uh, for, for a small team like that, a normal fund can only manage, you know, call it six to eight deals per partner. And so, uh, you know, call it, that would cap us at about 24 deals, maybe 30. And so we don't want to lead investments because we want to continue to invest. And it's because we see the world a lot like the internet in 1994. I know this internet thing is going to be a big deal. There's going to be lots of amazing businesses that get built in and around it. But could I pick them all in 1994? No. Uh, and so our strategy is instead of using a rifle, we're using a shotgun. And so we look a little bit like an index fund. And that is we first and foremost want to back great entrepreneurs you know, that are pursuing ideas that we think have lots of potential and it's not you know, the eighth person trying to do something uh, and, and where we believe the timing for that is right. Uh, and, and then we, we choose to invest with the, the hopes as the industry continues to develop that we have a, the thesis as it evolves, uh, you develop an asymmetry of information and then we'll you know, hopefully be in a position that by this year and next year, you know, you're backing up the truck around, you know, the, you know, the best and biggest ideas in the space. You know, you know, as a venture capitalist, we manage other people's money with the intention of delivering returns. Uh, you know, I'm a, a, a big investor in Bitcoin and things like Ethereum, uh, but that's not my fund. My fund is no, um, you know, there's no Bitcoin component of our fund. Uh, though a lot of our LPs are obviously investors in Bitcoin. I think we have 15, you know, sort of Bitcoin CEOs that are, you know, advisors or investors in the fund, you know, people like Bobby Lee and Charlie Lee and again, Will O'Brien and the list goes on and on and on. Okay. Well, Brock, uh, thanks so much for coming on. We're, we're, we're at the show at the end of our show and we also don't want to keep you stuck here because you, you're heading to South by Southwest, which I'm sure will be lots of fun. So uh, th thanks so much for coming on. It was, it was super interesting talking to you and exciting to hear about all the projects you've been all involved in and, and uh, interesting ways you've been supporting this industry. Well, I, thank you guys for, for having me. Uh, uh, we still got lots of work ahead. Absolutely. So I, I think I'm sure we'll, we'll have you back on at some point with, uh, to talk about all the interesting changes the industry has gone through in, in the meantime. Sounds good. Again, thank you. Yeah, so thanks so much for listening. For listening. We'll be back next week if you want to so be a part of Let's Talk Bitcoin Network so you can check out lots of great shows on letstalkbitcoin.com. If you want to listen to the, uh, our episodes, of course, you can subscribe to our show on uh, any of the podcast applications or you can watch video on youtube.com slash epicenterbitcoin. And the other thing we do is if you leave us an iTunes review and you send us an email at show at epicenterbitcoin.com, then we'll send you a t-shirt like this. We've sent out certainly over 50 to countries all over the world. So if you want one to, then please do that. So thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week.